Hi everyone, welcome to Wheel of Mind, the Wheel of Time point of view reread podcast. This season, we've been reading Matt Cawthon's perspective. Welcome to season two, episode 16. I'm your co-host, Lajara Dane of the White Aja. Hi, and I'm Giskel Semeris, a scholar from Ilian. Be warned that we here at the Wheel of Mind will drop spoilers at any time. In fact, I'm going to get us started today with a few spoilers from today's episode. Today we'll learn that Matt gets a second secret mission, he plays an unwinnable game, has some troubling encounters with both Aiel and Tinkers, and meets a new kindred spirit. And so today we're covering chapters 22 and 33 of Lord of Chaos. Could you get us started with your summary of chapter 22? Yes, thank you, Lajara. Chapter 22, entitled Heading South. This part of Matt's story opens with he and the band heading south and making very good time of it. They were halfway to Tyr by his estimate, in eleven days. Still, Matt was juggling six colored stones as he rode. The juggling made him think of Tom and wondered if Tom were still alive. Tom made him think of Elaine and Nynaeve, as he was traveling in their company the last he heard of, a thing that made life dangerous for any man, uh, quote, because they would not listen to reason, end quote. Matt almost dropped the stones with shock when Nalesian interrupted him with a question of what Matt thought it would be like to be a warder. Matt put the stones in his pouch. A warder? Never. They're all fools and dupes, letting Aes Sedai lead them around by the nose. What put a fool notion like that in your head? Nalesian admitted that it was all the Aes Sedai traveling north across the river. The band's supply ships kept bringing word of them, among other things including the rumor that Loghain had been set up by the Aes Sedai to be a false dragon. Matt mollified Nalesian Talmains and Darid with a joke at Talmains' expense, but the laughter quickly died. As a scout read up to Matt, he stopped the band with a hand signal. No trumpets to announce their position with the band. Shell Vannon was a fat, balding Anderman and was an uncaught horse thief. Matt had sought out men like him from right within the band and had set them up as his scouts. Fannin did not look the part, but he was one of the sneakiest men out there and he made a great scout. His report to Matt was basically, you need to see this. Matt rode ahead with Fannin and came upon a band of tinkers who had been massacred a day or two before. No one had survived, not women or children. Yet one tinker had scrawled a message in his own blood on his wagon. Tell the dragon reborn. They had no idea if that were the entire message or only part of it, and now there was no way to know. Matt instructed Vannon to finish burning that wagon so that no one else could see the message, and to only tell that a bunch of people had been killed. A party of Aiel had just by then caught up with the band, and Vannon suggested that they might have done it. Matt went back to the band with instructions to set up camp and to send some men out on burial detail. The camp was very quiet that night, and Matt had hardly eaten and definitely did not feel like going to sleep. Instead, he took a blanket out of his tent and laid off a little way, staring up at the stars and naming the constellations, just as he had done as a boy. Matt caught a furtive whisper of noise and raised up to see a group of Aiel surrounding his tent. Matt was prepared to silently sneak away when Talmanas began walking up toward his tent, roaring drunk, and, con- and trying to convince Matt to drink with him to kill the memories of the day. So Matt jumped up, running away as fast as he could, screaming, Out swords! I yell in the camp! Rally to the banner! Rally to the red hand! Rally, you dog-riding grave robbers! Knowing that the Aiel were right on his tail, Matt turned and began fighting before the first of his soldiers could arrive to help. Matt killed the first Aiel, but then the others were on him so fast that he could only defend himself, spinning his ashen dairy like a quarterstaff, blurring it with speed. Just then, Matt and the Aiel were surrounded by men from the band, many of them still in their small clothes. Matt managed to step back as soon as he could. Soon there were twelve dead Aiel, almost eighteen of the band were dead, and twice that many were wounded, including Talmanas, Darid, and Matt himself. Matt shocked the men with their orders that all the following nights their camps would have a ditch dug around them and a palisade built to keep anyone else from sneaking in without someone noticing. Then, after he was alone, Matt noticed that two of his tent ropes and some nearby bushes were cut straight across. It was the work of a gateway. 
Hearing a crunching footstep behind him, Matt spun around with a snarl and barely stopped himself from killing Oliver. What in the bloody pit of doom are you doing here? He asked. And as the story came out, it seemed that no one in Marone had really wanted to take care of Oliver, even for the gold. So he'd taken up a job of taking care of Master Burdian's horse, though he never got to ride it, and was more than pleased to work for the food, clothing, and new shoes that he'd been given. As Telmana's servant came up to sew up Matt's wounds, Matt took his mind off the pain by asking Oliver what he was carrying. He showed Matt, of course, his spare clothes and a red hawk's feather, a stone just the color of the sun, see? Another stone with a fish head in it, a blue-black turtle shell with stripes, and a small purse with five coppers and a silver penny. Also, he had the game of snakes and foxes that his father had made for him. Matt gave Oliver two gold crowns with the statement that a man needs a little gold in his pockets. Oliver refused out of pride, so Matt quickly asked him to earn it by carrying messages for him. None of the band could do it after all. They were too busy soldiering. Plus, he would have to take care of his own horse. Well, you said this was a really long chapter, but I think you did a great job summarizing it. It is difficult because, you know, I wax long-winded at times. But thank you. I love how in this chapter we get a lot of dramatic irony right away. He's thinking about Tom and how he's probably never going to see the poor guy again while he's juggling. And he's thinking about how he wished he could leave the Wonder Girls in some mild peril so that they could learn to appreciate how Matt pulls their bacon off the fire. Yes. Uh, which we know he got no gratitude for the last time. And in our very next Matt POV chapter that I'm going to summarize here after a while, he gets ordered to go rescue the Wonder Girls, and deliver a letter to Tom. So it's just funny that they're on his mind when they're about to come back up into the story and they're right. going to meet back up again. Yes, I, I love the way he thought of them, too. They'll probably get Tom killed because, you know, they never listen to anybody. And then they had this, I had this quote, it's a couple of sentences long here, naive, poking into everything a man did or said or thought and tugging your bloody braid at a fellow all the time. And Elaine, the bloody daughter heir, thinking she could get her way by sticking her nose in the air. And in another sentence, she smiled and flashed her dimple and expected everybody to fall down because she was pretty. And it, it's hard yeah, not to I do that. I love his thoughts about yes. Elaine, especially. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. No, it's so hard not to do that in a smarmy voice because the, oh, yeah. the tone comes through. You could tell he, in a way, has a thing for Elaine. Oh, not, yeah. Probably not in depth, but it's always, well, she thinks she can get away because she's pretty. So he's always noticing that she's pretty, and he always mm -hmm. has to throw that in there in any any interactions that were, or any time he thinks of her. I do like Matt and Elaine's tension a lot of the time, and I'm looking forward to them meeting back up in some, in our upcoming episodes so that we can explore that some more. Yes. We get a lot of people who are very adversarial with each other when they're supposed to be friends or lovers or whatever in this series, but for some reason, I'm really enjoying Matt and Elaine's tension that much more, and I could actually see how if she had not been destined to be with Rand and like obsessed with him at this point, how they could have ended up together. It could have been an enemies to lovers kind of trope right, or something. Right, right. Yeah, you, you could you could see that if the story were to go that way. There's at least enough there to build on to have that. With Nynaeve, it's more of the older sister who used to thump him with a stick a lot and beat yeah. him with different things. And yeah, would never be any kind of romantic interest there. I don't think he can even understand how anybody could think of Nynaeve that way, much less himself. So. Right. And it's funny because Lan, that she ends up matched up with, is another one of those people that is very hit or miss Nynaeve isn't him but nobody else is just drooling over Lan right, right. <laughs> now I think the actor hired to play him is good that's going to be a completely different story than how he's described in the books oh, as far as attractiveness oh yeah he, he will um, be on the t-shirts of so many teenage girls it, it'll be crazy yeah. but I remember Egwene thinking like why would anybody ever be interested in Lan? She just can't even see him as like a romantic or sexual person at all. And I, that's sort of mirroring how Matt is thinking about Nynaeve right, right now. Right. Yeah, I, I got some of the same sense. And as well, part of their attraction seemed to start not just with the physical. And this is just me. And, and again, maybe on a subsequent reread, I would pick up more of that. But it seems to me when he, when she snuck up on him, Warren. And she showed enough woodcraft, you know, that she could occasionally sneak up on him or track him. 
And that really caught his attention. It's like, wow, this is, this is very rare in a woman who could do something like this. And, and I think with him, it started with an admiration of her. And with her, it mm-hmm. kind of started with noticing that a man was admiring her and her skills, not just her looks. And that seemed to really uh, attract her to him. That, that's just my take on it. That may not be correct, but that's definitely the feeling I got from, oh, yeah. from those early interactions of, of why they started falling common- in love take that that their relationship started out of his admiration for her competence and she was finally in a place in her life where she could think of herself as an object of affection and admiration from a potential love interest whereas as a wisdom she had never had that freedom before in her role so she'd been very closed off from that part of herself yeah i I like their relationship too for that yeah yeah every relationship does not have to start off with this wow moment of seeing that person and being you know, just instantly attracted to them or, you know, sexually attracted or whatever, that it, it can start with an admiration of the person's qualities and the things about them and grow from there and, and have this mutual respect and regard for one another that in these two grew to be a blazing inferno of love. I mean, they couldn't, you know, both of them were constantly thinking of the other one and couldn't stop thinking of the other one. But it began with this admiration of, of their skills and just who they were rather than just this instant you know, uh, oh, I can't. I can't get the words. I want that chemical reaction. <laughs> That's not it. But this, right. this instant, you know, just attraction where you look at someone and you have that wow moment. Um, and and that happens more in fiction than it does in truth. I, I think it happens sometimes <laughs> in the real world. But I'm, I'm glad that Robert Jordan didn't take us there. He he let this one grow and simmer, and and it just feels more natural. Feels more organic to me. Yeah, it, the way Elaine feels about Rand is more of the traditional tropey kind of way, I think. Right. Now, there wasn't a, we didn't see her perspective when she first saw him, so there wasn't any love at first sight moment that we got to see as the reader. Right. But they had hung out that one time, and then they were together for like three days in the Stone of Tear, and then when she's in the White Tower, that's like all she can ever talk about. Right, yeah. <laughs> is, oh, I wonder what Rand, I bet Rand could dispatch this guy yeah. he had his sword right now yeah. it's, it's just everything's always about him so theirs feels a little more like oh, okay the hero ends up with the princess because that's what's supposed to happen right. to me <laughs> and i still maintain the entire triage of girls you know each one of them <laughs> well maybe not avienda but the other two only accepted because men prophesied it or, or knew it would happen it seems like mm-hmm. that's the only reason men put up with it. Men Farshaw put up with that. And this is the only reason that Elaine Turkan put up with that is because, the, well, it's got to happen. We can't change it. Well, uh, Avienda as well, she just was running away from knowing that, but she knew it from her trip to Roydion. Yes. Before she met the other two. So she also was not just, uh, I guess, smitten by him. Right. Now, before before Elaine knew that she was going to have to share him, she was smitten by him. The other two, had, they had to let that idea grow on them. Right. Men was like, well, I don't really know him, and he's not really the type of guy I'm into, but I, I guess, whatever, yeah. it's yeah. got to happen anyway. Yeah, it and, says, if, <laughs> yeah, if it shows that it's going to happen, I've just got to go with it. Well, okay. Avienda's just disgusted with herself. Like, right. I really, I have to end up with this wetlander? Well, yeah, I can't do that. And just I, physically right. runs away. I think from most the idea. of hers is the toe she incurs to Elaine oh, in yeah, her yeah. mind. You know, it's that, well, that's that what, entire yeah. thing of honor is that, I, you know, it's not that she's averse to falling in love with Rand so much as I can't do this to Elaine. You know, I've, I've yeah. claimed her as a near sister and I just, I can't do this to her. I love too much toe. And then, of course, you have the igloo and then she's really, you know, she just, Rand thinks she hates him. And here he finds himself attracted to her. She's always on his mind. He's like, but she hates me. And he's clueless, you know, the whole time. I, I just wish it had happened to Matt or Perrin because they both know how to talk to girls. <laughs> right, as we know. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting that we've explored that because that background is coming back up in our next chapter here, too. I didn't know we were going we were going to go on this tangent about the romantic relationships, yes, but yes. It, I think it actually sets the stage pretty well. Okay, thank you. And I, yeah, maybe I jumped the gun too early on that, but uh, no, that's fine. the the Aiel attack in the middle of the night, and it comes right on the heels of, of course, the the terrible massacre of the Tinkers. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, no one can wrap their minds around why this would happen. And, of course, being an Andor man, Vannon first thinks of the Aiel, just as the Kyrian or anybody would, refers to them as the savages, even. Yeah. Uh, of course, we know that the Aiel avoid Tinkers. Mm-hmm. They, they would never harm them, but 
you know, they, they just avoid them because tinkers make them uncomfortable because of that, that shared past, the shared history that, that neither one of them really want to admit to. The way he just kind of offhand makes that remark, and Matt doesn't really defend them, but pretty much says, no, if they had wanted to kill me, you know, they, they had their chance. They, they came up when he was just Vanning and myself there, and, you know, they, they, they could have killed me and nobody could have stopped them. So I don't think this was, attack was any of our IEL, more or less. So after defending them, then you have this terrible attack in the middle of the night. And yeah. Matt's timing his luck had he not been outside his tent, just laying there looking at the stars, kind of reminiscing about his own childhood. He would have died. He would never have known they were coming. To go back after the attack, Start looking at the clues and realize, hey, someone opened a gateway here, practically inside Matt's tent, or just close enough to cut two of the ropes, and all those little I'm bushes. I'm surprised he reasoned that out too. Yeah, it's but, a weird set of pieces of evidence that I don't know if I would have put together, but maybe just visually having seen. A, I don't remember how many gateways he's seen at this point, but it can't be that many. No, just I, ran popping into his tent once, right. I think. Well, uh, or, so far, uh, I don't know about the tent. It was it was back in Maron in his room. Yeah. It's oh, at yeah. least once then, if not more, but we know of that time at least where he's looked back on it. So he's aware of the gateways. And, but just the way everything's in this perfect straight line, at first he thought the IEL had just cut those ropes. And it's like, well, mm-hmm. no, that, they wouldn't have done that. And then they also mowed the grass too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, all the little bushes. There. And the way everything's cut in this laser like line, that was the only thing that fit. Um, and then he had this thought of, you know, so the forsaken after me again, next time it'll be a thousand Trollocs or whatever, uh, not knowing. And I like the fact that Jordan holds us back that none of them know right now that the Trollocs cannot use gateways. Yeah. Th- there's been more than once where that was kind of brought up of, hey, they could just weave a gateway and just, we could have hordes of Trollocs rushing on us before we know what's going on. And it's, it's two or three times that has come up in their conversations or in this case in Matt's private thoughts. But, yeah, it's a very lucky for them fact about the metaphysics of this world. Right. Very convenient. Right. But <laughs> Otherwise, I don't know. I think the shadow would have been overpowered. I think he had to nerf them on purpose there. Yeah, I'll take it. For whatever reason, yeah. I'll take it. <laughs> now, in, in his fight with the Aiel, the fact that he survived it at all is amazing. Being very fast, running, knowing when to stop and turn. And he even said he didn't know if it was Taverin because he certainly didn't hear anything. But he just knew that he was about to get a spear in the back. So he turns around just in time, fights him until his men gets there. And then he has this quote, the general who leads from the front of the battle is a fool. That came from one of those old memories, a quote from somebody whose name was not part of the memory. Then he thought a man could get killed in there. That was pure Matt Cawthon, end quote. <laughs> and it's regrettable that so many men are dead or wounded, but... That's because they were fighting Aiel, and Aiel are the desert ninja warriors who, they are very good at what they do. Now, I don't recall us ever getting any clues as to who sent this one. We know it had to be one of the Forsaken or Dreadlord or or something, and and Matt is trying to puzzle that out for himself because these guys, they might have been Shido, they might have just been dark friends because... He found out the hard way there are dark friends among the Aiel as well. Mm-hmm. But, I know. sometimes wonder if they are the ones from the Blight that are the turned ones or something like that. Because, you know, we know they have a foothold in the Shido. And, and like you mentioned, there are dark friends among the Aiel. And around this time, Savannah of the Shido is also meeting with some of the Forsaken. Yes, yes. Is it Samael she's been meeting with? I, I, you, I think so. I don't know that it ever really tells. She just talks about meeting with a man who gives her the little yeah. stone cube. and you know, I think we end up seeing it. from the point of view eventually of whichever of the Forsaken it is. Ah, but okay. I'm, I'm not far enough. Uh, I only just started Crown of Swords in my reread, so I don't know yet. There are too many details for my old brain to hold together. So, <laughs> yeah, I just I do not recall if we ever get that, but I'm sure yeah. we do. And, and But I don't think her relationship with this forsaken has gone far enough so that she is following the directions of them to send some of her forces through a gateway just right. yet no, so I, I thought of that i'm like we know the shido are allied with the shadow <laughs> interesting that they're so phonologically similar too yes i've thought um, of that before too <laughs> but i don't know that 
they're that overtly allied with the shadow yet and that right. Savannah has enough people on her side that she could let in on this kind of secret to send them in on this mission. So right. I don't have any other leads other than thinking maybe it was, yeah, Ishmael was some of his that go into the blight and end up getting turned and, and live in that village or whatever. Yeah, see, and, and that never occurred to me. That's altogether a distinct possibility, though. But, you know, Matt is wounded from this. Not very badly, but he has all these little wounds. Talmana is wounded. And, and I love it. Matt is always coming up with these quips, these real smart aleck responses that are so <laughs> not funny. Not a bloody side of beef. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah, that's when he's getting sewn up. Yeah. My leg's not a bloody side of beef. My lord is right. His leg is not a bloody side of beef. But not only he, but Darid gets one in on this one. You know, he's oh, yeah. he's binding up Talmanas and so well, Talmanas here will live unless all the brandy leaks out of him. <laughs> <laughs> that one made me laugh out loud. I like how Matt is still collecting all these little knickknacks like a magpie. Yes. It's yes. really cute, despite all the growth that we talked about in the last episode, that he's still the same Matt with his collecting and his juggling. And then it's even cuter to see that reflected in Oliver, who has this bag of the same type of stuff that Matt collected that we saw in his first point of view or the one of the first few points of view chapters in The Dragon Reborn. Right. A feather, a shiny rock, a yes. turtle shell. You know, I love it. I, I really <laughs> oh, do. Even after Matt has all this gold and all these fine clothes and stuff, he's still carrying around those things right. too. And you cannot yeah, miss you, know, you cannot miss the synchronicity of it, of the, the chapter opening with Matt. You know, he's juggling these five kind of stones and he likes because they're brightly colored, yeah. you know. When he stops, he collects them, puts them in his bag. And he says, well, he could pick up more stones anywhere, but he liked the colors. So he's <laughs> holding on to these just because he liked the colors of them. And then, let's see, what else was it? He said, uh, an eagle feather, uh, a piece of weathered snow white stone that might have been carved with scrolls once. And then there's another place where they had camped. He found this rock that could have been the head off of a statue, but that would have yeah. so big that it would have taken a whole wagon, so he couldn't carry that with him. But <laughs> it's just these, these random things you know, that he likes, and he's back to that old collecting. And then, like you said, with Oliver, yeah, Oliver, you know, what you got in the bag there? Well, he's start, and he, he's doing it just to distract himself while he's being sewn up after oh, the yeah. battle. And, and yeah, Oliver starts bringing all these things, a red hog's feather, a stone just the color of the sun, you know, which really made me wonder what in the heck kind of stone was this? You know, is this some Fool's kind of gold or something? Like <laughs> yeah, <laughs> or some kind of precious stone that, yeah, just nobody really thought to make things out of. I don't know. It just, I thought it was pretty mm -hmm. to think about. The stone with the fish head in it. I mean, it's mm -hmm. going back to Matt's fossil when he was a boy. You know, it just, yeah. you see so many reflections of this. And then the blue back turtle shell. And then the small purse with five coppers and a silver penny. And man, mm -hmm. that takes me back to Matt after the, being healed from the effects of the dagger in Tarvalin and waking yep. up in his room. And oh, he's got, yeah, he's got these rocks. He's got this feather. He's got, you know, the bag with about that much money. I think he had two silver pieces and a few more coppers, but it was just so hilarious to me to see that. And so, yeah, he realizes this kindred spirit. And that's one of the wonderful things where, you know, even though he is the same old Matt, we do still see this maturity about him that mm -hmm. he doesn't say anything to offer about collecting things you should or shouldn't or you know some other man might just say well this is foolish you know don't waste time on this kind of junk it's just a turtle shell you know a dead animal skeleton or whatever you know but instead oh yeah i had a turtle shell once you know these green sliders or green striped yeah, or whatever I love how he validates him yes yeah. yes so, so he makes oliver feel the way he always wished someone would make him feel as a boy when he mm -hmm. found all these things that everybody else thought he was wasting his time. And he wanted somebody, like you said, to validate him, to make him feel like, yeah, that, oh, who was it? Tam Althor, they see, yeah, that yeah. might have been a you know, piece of a statue at one time, a man's sure, ear or whatever. Sure, that could be an ear. Right. I, I think I could see it. And so he does that to Oliver. He validates him. He doesn't try to downplay this or tell him he's silly or anything. But instead, just, yeah, yeah, I think very well. That's neat. You know, I had one of these. And, and here, a man needs a little gold. And, of course, Oliver's pride will not let him. You know, he, he gets mad. I don't accept charity. And mm -hmm. so Matt has a rich scramble in his brain, which we love. Because when Matt's thoughts scramble, you know, that's when he comes up with the best ideas. And, <laughs> and does the best things. Well, I need somebody to carry messages for me. But now you'll have to take care of your own horse. Because, you know, he met Oliver 
Clint Oliver wanted to get up on the, this man's horse and kept touching it, you know, the Mirandian. And here in the camp, you know, he's found out Oliver has been taking care of some of the soldiers' horses because he, he just loves horses so much. And so Matt uses that and it's like, Matt would have made a great psychologist. He he understands so much about what motivates people, which, of course, also makes you a great horse trader because you have to understand what motivates people. Yeah, um, yeah just, just some wonderful things. And, and I love the synchronicity of starting out with him and his new magpie collection and ending up with Oliver with his little magpie collection. And as well, in upcoming chapters, there's so many times when you know, Oliver gives this insolent little grin, and Matt starts thinking, where has he been picking this up from? <laughs> Everything he does. Where did he get that? Must be from one of his other uncles. Yes. Yeah. One of these men have been teaching him bad habits. And it's, it's and he's just a perfect reflection of Matt in that regard, and I love that about him. Yeah. I like how you noted that Matt has a good understanding of what motivates people, and he can use that to get things done. Instead of just butting heads with folks or trying some kind of strategy from the top down because he believes it should be done that way. He's yeah. willing to adapt when things don't go the way he expects. And he's really good at that. One of the ways that he does that in this chapter is his recruiting strategy for scouts, which is very innovative. He gathers all the horse thieves that he <laughs> can possibly get a hold of and puts them in scouting positions and he pays them a lot to do this yes and i think many people would be opposed to such a strategy because they wouldn't want to reward criminals so heavily they would want to find those guys and get them out of their army right but matt is not driven by some kind of ideology he's not creating a meritocracy completely at least at this point out of some kind of sense of justice or anything he's doing what's going to get the job done and he understands what motivates thieves. Now, Matt has never been that criminal himself, but he always has been somebody who's been, he's skirted close to that, at least, right? He's always been a little, done stuff a little illegitimately, you know? So he understands what motivates these folks. They are just going to do the least work to get the most money at the least risk, probably. And if he can Uh, raise the stakes so that it's just more profitable to actually work for him than to do what they've been doing illegitimately that they'll do that and that actually is the case for a lot of people so um, many people it's just it might just be easier to sell drugs and you can make a lot more money right than than going to the trouble of doing any of the other types of things that might be very very much more difficult to attain having to get years of education or whatever depending on your environment upbringing all this other stuff and so matt understands if you want to get the criminals off the streets they they need opportunities right and these folks it's not i'm not trying to say that these horse thieves were horse thieves because they didn't have any better opportunities but they were rational in the reasons that they were thieves. And so Matt thinks, can I appeal to their rational economic self-interest and uh, lure them over to work for me? And it works very well. I think he's a lot more of a politician than he realizes in this regard. He's not really thinking a lot about overall political strategy or how he approaches leadership. It's kind of just these tiny little these small decisions one by one that we see him make. And he seems to do things on a case by case basis. But I think it's interesting where it's placed in the story to watch Matt making all these changes in military leadership at uh, the time when Egwene is about to come into her power and how they handle their leadership differently. So her leadership arc is just about to begin in this book. And she's also willing to do a lot of unconventional or frowned upon actions in her politics for pragmatic reasons. She is going to do what it takes to get things done. Oftentimes that's, it used to be she's going to do whatever it takes to learn what she wants to learn because she's so hungry for knowledge. Now that she's in leadership, her goals are going to be a little different. Um, But she's so much more consciously political about what she's doing. She does have ideology to begin with that drives her actions, whereas Matt doesn't have any kind of like big picture top down belief system that he at least articulates as being behind his motives. So I think it's just interestingly placed in these middle books where we see both these characters growing this way. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, very well put, by the way. I, I love that. You you summed that up so well. Um, Thanks. You know, and, and with what Matt did with the horse thieves, it kind of puts me in mind of what we see in, in the security industry on occasion mm-hmm. is, 
you you take someone who is a thief to find out how would you get past the security so you can build a security system or, mm. or a set of systems that are more difficult to bypass or get around um, yeah. because it's amazing how many I'm going to put quote unquote good guys design a security system or a camera system that just about anybody could get past or get beyond because oh, you're yeah. thinking, okay, we're going to cover all the doors. Well, what about your windows and, you know, things like that and things that you just don't think of, but a thief does think of. And it's exactly what Matt did here. You're right. He, instead of taking someone who's just going to be a scout, who's, who thinks their job is just to ride ahead, see what's ahead and come back and report it. He wants men who can do that without being seen. He yeah. doesn't want an enemy force to encounter some scouts and say, oh, here's some scouts. There must be an enemy force on the way, you know, and be prepared for him. So you naturally want someone who doesn't even have to think about skulking and hiding. They do it by rote. They do it second nature because, yeah. you know, to get caught as a horse thief is to be killed for a horse thief. And, and no one wanted to be hung for that. So you either were good at what you did or you got weeded out very early, um, and so, you know, Darwinism took care of, of bad horse thieves, people who could not yeah. sneak. And so Matt took advantage of the rest. Uh, okay, yeah, you got some guys you suspect of it. Give me names. And then you'll get those people to give me names. And because those are the people that know how to sneak around, to not be seen, to not get caught, get in and out of places. Um, you know, we'll see upcoming chapters where Vannon gets in and out of Saladar without some of the warders seeing him. <laughs> and, that, yeah. and that was that's a big accomplishment. And and Vannon was the only one really who was, who was sneaky enough to do it. Yeah. I like also just one small thing about this chapter that's going to come up in a lot of future ones yes. is how Matt thinks that Talmanis has no sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> it is completely lost on him that Talmanis yes. is the straight man to Matt's more eccentric comedic antics. And, yes. and Elysian yes. and Darrett are also a little more outrageous in their comedy and a little more over in their humor yeah. Talmanis just has this dry wit this whole time and matt just thinks he's a stick in the mud right and i love that doesn't see it yeah yeah i, I love the interplay and and if matt not getting it not understanding that yeah <laughs> i agree uh and and you got to remember with you people of Kyrie and upbringing naturally are more reserved more quiet yeah and and, you know, Matt's just not used to that. He doesn't know how to handle that. So, yeah, you're right. It does set up for some very funny moments. Yeah. I like that you brought up a mystery in your chapter of who sent those Aiel. But there's also another one. And I don't, I wonder if it is stated in Lord of Chaos and I just missed it since I finished the book recently. But who killed the Tuathan caravan as well? Who committed that carnage do you have any leads or ideas i don't recall it ever being explained and and i haven't come across it yet in, in my personal reread and i've just gotten through this mm -hmm. and i'm into crown of swords so i don't remember it ever being brought up again my personal head canon is that some of the dragon sworn uh, mm -hmm. but i don't know that may be well out of their range it's mm -hmm. just anybody's guess. Like they said, it might have been brigands because they took the horses. But brigands could have taken the horses without killing everyone, especially the children. Yeah, so, and that doesn't really line up with the message either. I do think that that's the entire message, tell the dragon reborn. I think somebody just wants them to know that they're killing innocents just to get to him. Yeah, could probably. be. It could have been done by the Forsaken. To have already kind of staked out an area. Hey, we know when the band gets here, they'll stop when they see this. They'll at least stop and bury the dead. And now we'll know where to bring our assassins in. So it might have been a group oh, of, yeah. of assassins, a much larger group, but a group brought in by one of the Forsaken just to kind of get the band to stop. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. But it also makes me wonder where Pat on Fane is at this point. And is he near the two rivers or something or did that already happen yeah, <laughs> i'm really that started happening. Kind of mixed he's up kinda, right he kind of fades yeah. away for a while and then they yeah. bring him back a little later so he's already had his seems stand like at, something he would do kind right of. yeah well, yeah good very very evil and twisted i mean to to just kill innocent people who will just stand there and not fight back mm -hmm. uh, and and like the women and children and just just it's just sickening but yeah it did it did make me wonder about the uh after you said that about the aiel because they would have set up such an ambush that when you attack here 
well, the men will just stand there to try to give the women and children time to get away. But no, we, we've already flanked them and, you know, they run right mm. into a second ambush. Um, that, that would be, you know, something that would be done by more warlike people. But, um, yeah, yeah we, I don't know that it ever explicitly says. So I think we just have to uh, make our own guess about this. And if mm-hmm. it does explicitly say somewhere we have a listener that's screaming at their, yeah. <laughs> at their phone right wait. now. Yes. Us. Yes. So please <laughs> tell us if we do that. Thank you. Having characters speculate about whether it was the Aiel makes me think that it wasn't any of them, even the Shido. But that's just kind of, uh, I think that maybe that's a misdirection, personally. Right. I find it interesting how the Aiel regard the Tuathon, which you brought up earlier, that they just have this disgust of them and they want to ignore them. They don't even want to think about them existing. They, they're they not going to physically hurt them. It It's worse, it's this kind of indifference that's worse than hate. Like, they're yes. not even... They're below notice. Right. And it actually reminds me a lot of this book I just finished reading called The Body Keeps the Score, all about trauma. There's an audible version of it out there, too. So for anybody who's interested, it has a really good scientific look at what trauma does to the brain and what types of behaviors it explains and how a lot of other psychological disorders can be really PTSD that's just not showing up in a way that clinicians have been noticing what their kind of checklists or whatever. Right. But the point of it was one of the ways that many people who've experienced interpersonal trauma as children react as adults is that they end up not having empathy for people in a similar situation as them. They actually have this disgust and disdain of them, of what they used to be. If they have therapy sessions where they have to think about their inner child or even when they have their own child, they tend to react with this disgust at the weakness of a child who's in fear or suffering of some kind. And it's because they had to develop that kind of attitude about themselves and their own vulnerability as children to protect themselves. It was a way to protect themselves from being so hurt in a way that doesn't have any explanation that a kid can understand. So they have to learn, I'm just disgusting and awful. That's why I'm being treated this way. I'm garbage. When they have their own children and their children are normally needy, They see that as being weak and disgusting and they tend to perpetuate the victimization because of that. Or they may be very neglectful parents at best in a lot of those situations before they get some help. And this reminds me of the cultural trauma that the Aiel have experienced by learning their origins and all of the toe that they have from betraying the Aes Sedai. So the leaders who do learn how that happened and learn how they have betrayed their mission and come so far from what they used to be. Maybe that's part of why they hate the Tuathan. It's almost like looking at their inner child and seeing they're weak and disgusting, but it's really because they don't want to have to identify with those feelings, not because they actually hate the Tuathan themselves that much. I'm having a hard time exactly fitting together the last part of that point, but I just, that parallel felt so, it stood out to me a lot in this yes. chapter. For oh, it reason. really does. Like that, And I know I oversimplified it, but yeah, it's like they, they hate the shame of mm-hmm. what that would be like to to be that helpless, and all. but wow, yeah. that is so deep, and and I have never really been aware of that connection. But that it makes so much sense when you say it. I kind of wish I'd been thinking about that more back when I read the Shadow Rising. Right. But I think we're going to see more of the effects of the bleakness and everything in later books. So maybe mm-hmm. I'll just keep an eye on that in right. my reread. I'm kind of yeah. curious to see it, like the brotherless and stuff like that, and yes. see how it matches up with what I've learned a lot recently about trauma. Yes. Wow. And to have Robert Jordan almost instinctively tie things like that together that, that we're just yeah. now getting an understanding of is, is not only unique, but it's satisfying as well. Uh, mm-hmm. This is so many real life things to this that, that I guess he saw, but didn't, you know, quantify it that way. Yeah. But, uh, he does a lot of these things where he takes something that is a common occurrence in real life and he turns it up to 11 in some kind of fantasy way just to kind of put it more in the reader's face so that you have to think about this concept and one of the ways he did that in this chapter is through you know this message that reverberates throughout matt's story in many of his point of view chapters is who would ever want to be a soldier who would choose this life yes and he thinks about that a lot in this chapter even before he sees the slaughter of the tuathan and after he comes upon this carnage it's even more magnified this carefree boy has had to grow up through seeing war but he has just done it in this again this way that's dialed up to 11 
right. because he has lived it many, many times. So he's an old soul, I guess you can say. Yeah. Um, and so he, he's wise beyond his years because of these horrors that he has seen and how he's had to learn and grow from it. And I think that that's Robert Jordan's way of amplifying what just about any military service member experiences when they get deployed and have to see uh, and be involved in any fighting is that they're so young and they end up kind of living more than you would expect for their age, like too much for their young years already. Uh, knowing that he was a Vietnam veteran, there's just so much of that experience packed into these books. You know, it, it would be, I think, impossible to pick out exactly which pieces are accounts inspired from accounts from military history or fictional or or what comes from his literal personal memories. There's no way to really know, but you can just see that it's very heavily probably inspired by those experiences. Yes. Oh, yes. I, th I think so. It's just, uh, just the depictions of battles and all are, it's not to the detail that, that you get out of reading a military book, you know, military history, but it's definitely from the perspective of someone who's been there and not just read about battles in books. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, so, this this realism, the, the sickening images you get after demise well, after, you know, all of these big battles yeah. of just the, that it's always oh, not all glory and happiness that we won, but instead it's almost this despair that I won and my friends over here didn't, but yeah, know, almost dead yesterday, probably dead tomorrow, but alive, gloriously alive gloriously today. Gloriously alive today. Yes. So. Love that hopeful message. and I, But that's uh, about all the thoughts I had on this chapter. Well, if you would, please take us into chapter 33. See what more fun we can have. Chapter 33 is called Courage to Strengthen. In this chapter, Matt's point of view is actually sandwiched in between two Egwene point of views. In the first one, she is asking to meet her toe to the wise ones. And then in the last part of the chapter, she's actually meeting the toe and having been forgiven or kind of made up that debt by the end. So in the middle, we have this perspective switch to Matt, who is playing a game of snakes and foxes with Oliver. It involves rolling dice to move the player's pieces on the board, attempting to make it to the center. However, players must also roll for the snakes and foxes, who can then overtake the player's pieces before they can win. In fact, that's what happens every time. It's unwinnable if you play following the rules. They lose one round, and then Oliver wants to play another, see if they can win this time. So to open up a new game, he draws a triangle in the air with his finger, and he divides it with a wavy line down the middle, reciting the words, Courage to strengthen, fire to blind, music to dazzle, iron to bind. Matt can answer none of the boys' questions about why the game is played this way or what those words mean, but he does get creepy feelings recalling the game from his ancient memories. Just then, Darid pops in and joshes Matt around a little bit about his care for Oliver before he has to get to the serious business of announcing the Lord Dragon's imminent visit to the camp. Matt leaves his tent to find Rand and Avienda coming toward him. Matt sends Oliver away and has a private audience with Rand. Well, private except that Avienda is still tagging along. Rand just has one little favor to ask. Just, just one little thing. Shouldn't really change their plans at all except for the whole part about marching towards Samael to distract him. N won't change anything except for that. Matt's not ready to hear it. It's really too late to change the plan. They're on their way. It's just going to be a few more days uh, when they get to Tyr, and then they're going to cross the river and meet up with Wyramon's folks to march towards Samael and Ilion. But Ran interrupts him. Your new top priority, Matt, is to escort Elaine to the Lion Throne, and Avienda's going to come with you. Avienda butts in at this point to make sure that everybody understands that Rand is not ordering her to go there. She needs to talk to Elaine for her own reasons, and she looks really unhappy about it, which makes Matt uncomfortable and kind of scared for Elaine. Elaine is in this place called Saladar on the river Aranen, and Rand points this out on a map and tells him he has to take his whole army with him because this place is crawling with Aes Sedai, and I need you to intimidate them. So I'm going to gateway you there. Oh, and as you come through Alt Altara and Mirindi on your way back, use my banner and see if you can pick up some of the Dragon Sworn while you're at it. And uh, also see if you could just kind of hand me those two countries. And just like a couple dozen more little details, no big deal. Take super duper good care of Elaine. She needs to get alive to the Lion Throne. And Matt's like, sure, sure, I'll treat her like my own sister. 
Oh, right. That reminds me. Matt, um, speaking of, your sister Bode is in Camelin with Farron and Alana, and she's training to be Aes Sedai. So could you help make sure that she doesn't actually get to the tower in its current broken state? Maybe you could use some of those Aes Sedai that you bring back with you to try and stop them. And while you're at it, keep an eye out for Egwene. I think she's in big trouble with the Aes Sedai. Like, they might have found out that she's been posing as a full sister, and she should be somewhere in Saladar, too, by the time you get there. So see if you can snatch her out. Also, uh, Tom should be somewhere near Elaine. So could you deliver this letter to him? And then Rand leaves abruptly. Matt wonders which noblewoman would be writing to Tom so intimately when he looks at the seal and the handwriting. Hmm. Interesting. Matt has Oliver fetch Talmanis, Darid, and Elysian, and he gives Avienda a warning about her being under his command. And I don't want any trouble. After all, he's seen how Ran and Elaine used to canoodle back in the Stone of Tear, and now he sees how Avienda and Ran now look at each other. So this seems like a recipe for disaster. There's certain to be some kind of trouble here, right? She assures him that she knows how to follow a battle leader, but any man who tries to make a woman get on a horse might just get a knife in his ribs. Uh, okay. Right, so, uh, how did she know that he was going to try to get Avienda to ride a horse? Are women mind readers or what? Anyway, Matt studies the map, and he plans his approach. It's going to be slow and deliberate, so as not to rush up and frighten the Aes Sedai. Nobody wants to frighten Aes Sedai. Meanwhile, Avienda is honing her knife while just looking at him. Not scary at all, not creepy at all, just honing a knife while she's staring at him. Talmanis, Darid, and Elysian arrive, so he gives them a skinny on the situation. Quote, We're going to tickle some Aes Sedai under the chin, rescue a mule, and put a nose girl on the lion throne. Oh, yes, that's Avienda. Don't look at her crosswise or she'll try to cut your throat and probably slit her own by mistake. End quote. Avienda, for some reason, seems really tickled by what he just said, and she laughs out loud at it. And thus ends Chapter 33, Courage to Strengthen. Who knew that Matt would be so good at Aiel humor? Right? Really? <laughs> Yeah, uh, he's <clears throat> the Aiel respect him for a lot of reasons. They like a lot of the things that he does, and now we can just add humor to that list. Yes, yes. He he, he may not get Aiel humor, but he can he can dish it out. So. Yeah. So many things in this in this I sort of said chapter, but in this point of view that are, are so funny. Again, your your ending quote was just really awesome <laughs> uh, because that's what I had taken notes of too. I like how the you mentioned the private conversation, except Avienda's going to be there. Of course, mm. what Matt catches and nobody else does is there's another set of ears listening. They're really big ears on a really ugly face because Oliver oh, yeah. is tiny just outside the tent flaps. You know, he was so overawed to find out the dragon reborn is coming to visit <laughs> that you know he could not help but hide and listen into the conversation. And this segment prefaces one of the the things that irritated me about the story because i mm. I was with it so far yeah we've got uh you know matt leading the army down at tier that's going to catch samael's attention so rand can do an end run and try to take out samael you know got it that that's the perfect plan that's exactly what they need to do mm. and then he gets a babysitting job right in the middle of it which turns into a whole side trip, and we'll get into that in some upcoming episodes. But it's like you, you got to finish one thing, buddy. You know, you yeah. don't stop in the middle of this job to do that job, and then think you'll circle back. You'll never circle back to it like that. You finish mm -hmm. one job, but he's so frustrated with events, or excuse me, Rand is so frustrated with events in Camlin and and Kyrian, and he just wants that dealt with. I don't know why he couldn't have tried to pick a regent to sit on the lion throne with the understanding right. if you take power away from Elaine, I will kill you, but you just, you run this. Uh, yeah. Similar. I think Dylan would have been appropriate. She yes. seems, um, and, and later when she supports Elaine, we know that, I mean, Rand right. can't know that at this point, but even the interactions that he's had with her so far, she's the one who seems the least ambitious to try to actually grab that power. Right. And so that might make her a wise choice to give it to. And, and maybe I'm, um, just getting a little frustrated with the fact that it's not just Rand's plans that are in effect here because there are some of the Aes Sedai from the tower who have entirely different plans and they're interfering with what he's doing. And, and we understand that and we see, you know, the effects of it later in, in upcoming books. But 
yeah, it's just it's so frustrating that he couldn't finish that one job. But in a way, uh, sometimes my life gets like that too. Some things get put on the back burner. Some plans get put on hold. And life throws you a big curveball and you just have to go with it. But it seems yeah. that Rand kind of caused this curveball himself. But he but I understand did, I he, does, so. <laughs> he does not want to stay camped out in Kyrian or Camlin because then, you know, the Forsaken are coming after him. I think he mm-hmm. wants to stay fluid, you know, get a land on that throne so he can go do his thing and go after them, fight them on, on his ground and at, at his time, not their ground yeah. at their time, which makes sense. But yeah, buddy, you, you just, you're getting too distracted here and you're trying to do too much of it yourself. Yeah. It is a really frustrating turn of events for sure. I'm looking forward to some of these next chapters though, where Matt, actually does interact with the wonder girls again oh yeah so i mean there are some places where i don't like where this plot goes but i'm looking forward to at least some of that yeah yeah may may get tired of some of the side tracks it goes on but the 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 interplay between that group is precious you'll you'll never find more people who misunderstand one another stumble all over in front of each other who have worse images of one another Mm. Then just Matt Nynaeve and, and Elaine together are yes. attention enough, <laughs> or Nynaeve and Matt, or Nynaeve yes. and Elaine. It's this terrible triangle. For yes, sure. it is. But you get the three of them, and you you cannot have a, a recipe for disaster that's any worse other than the what they love to throw in books and movies of the love triangle. And this is not the love triangle. This is yeah. just the getting in each other's way and tripping each other up triangle, and it's hilarious. <laughs> and I do enjoy that. I've got one question about this chapter well i have several this is one i'm bringing him now matt doesn't really have the time to process this information that rand gives him about his sister bode going on to become Aes Sedai. Right, right. well you know i mean he learns so many things at once he doesn't get to process really many of them other than okay here's what the plan is going to be but rand's just like throwing another thing at him immediately so all we get is a short line talking about how shocked he is but i'm not exactly sure which way to interpret his thoughts since Rand just bulldozes on past that immediately. So he says, quote, Bode, who used to run tell their mother every time he did anything that was fun, end quote. So is he, there's two ways I could read this. Is he worried for Bode? Like, Bode? My little sister who used to go, you know, get me in trouble all the time? Or, you know, thinking that she's kind of in some kind of danger around Aes Sedai. I think maybe that's part of it, but Another way of reading this is that kind of the same way he thinks about Elaine and Nynaeve and Egwene uh, when he first realizes they're in the tower and he doesn't know how much he can trust them. Is he just more concerned that his little sister, who was already a narc on him when he was a kid, is now becoming a cop? <laughs> is, I wonder if that's what he's thinking about here. But it's hard to say. We don't get yeah. enough follow up there. That she can really get me in trouble now, big time. Yeah, she wants to, yeah. That that's kind of my take on it. But yeah, yeah well, that, like that and one better. plus the fact that she can't be old enough. You know, everybody oh, yeah, thinks that yeah. of younger brothers and sisters and cousins. Yeah. And everybody. Well, they're not old enough for that yet. But yeah, that's a good point. They She's are probably only just braided her hair or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Or he probably hasn't even realized she's that old yet. And it no. just hits him, you know, because he's been away for a couple of years now. Uh, mm-hmm. By this time, I think they have just passed midwinter, which would, would make it two years from the original mm. night in Emmons Field. Although it doesn't yeah. seem like winter because it's so hot and dry and, you know, the, right. the dark one is touching the weather. But yeah, I think they've just passed the, the two year mark sometime right before this. Yeah, well, it would be easy to figure out because they're almost about to have the festival, the Feast of Lights and High Chaseline at the beginning of Crown of Swords. Oh, is, yes. Yeah. So that would be our marker to figure that out. Uh, there's a great timeline, actually, I found a while back that I think I'll send you. I used it to figure out if there was enough time for Avienda's hair to have grown out enough as it did in the Lord of, in Lord of Chaos. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> because she used to have basically this like buzz cut or at least a really short pixie cut with just the rat tail right Right. and then in lord of chaos he describes it as like brushing her shoulders and so i'm like hang on a minute now having grown out a pixie a couple of different times that takes like a year to get your first ponytail oh wow! (laughs) and i'm like i know it's not been that long so i looked it up i looked at this calendar and it looked like it had only been about four months. I'm like, oh, yeah, Robert Jordan just doesn't understand oh. hair. That's fine. <laughs> no, no, no. The one power. 
Oh, okay, so. <laughs> yeah. There we go. <laughs> because what That's woman? Fair. What woman could be around a man like that and not do something to make herself more beautiful? Right. <laughs> you know, I never thought about how you might could change your hair with it. That's uh, fair. I, I don't know that you really can. I just had to throw that out there. That's our our uh, little <laughs> you know plot rescue for this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She had to do something, but no, it, it, that was probably just an oversight because it, taking years to write the book, it's hard to imagine a person's hair wouldn't grow out like that. When right. when in book time or in character time, only you know a few months have passed. But it's easy to overlook things like that. I. I'm sure there are dozens of, of small things like that. Oh yeah. Um, and not the... to like not to like cinema sins find continuity errors or whatever in this. <laughs> I, I don't want to seriously no. do that. I was just kind of jokingly. No. Oh, I know. I know. Uh, no, we're not trying to tear the story apart. We're just enjoying yeah. the story. But there there are yeah. always going to be some things like that. that For you sure. Find. And we both do have our hall pass to still love Wheel of Time and also criticize it. But yes. we can also criticize it in a tongue-in-cheek way sometimes, too. Yes. Very well said. One thing I did like about this, this segment, I keep wanting to call it the chapter, <laughs> is yeah. Robert Jordan has this way of kind of bookending the beginning and end of a chapter or a, a point of view like this. And we do have a, a bit of a bookend in this one. It just took me a while to find it and to remember what I was going to say earlier. Mm-hmm. And the the first is it opens with him playing Snakes and Foxes. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I like how Matt is uncomfortable by this. He's still not put it together in his mind what this is, yeah. even with the little poem they say when they start the the game that has mm-hmm. just been ritualized and, and been passed down for you know a few thousand years here but still he doesn't really understand that doesn't put it together but i like how it makes him uneasy and then near the end of the chapter rand hands this letter oh yeah I hand this to tom when you see him and it was offhand yeah. and but contained within that letter is something dealing directly with the snakes and foxes and their world and and it's so subtle, I didn't catch it at first, but on your explaining and giving your synopsis of the chapter, or the point of view, it just really hit me. Wow, he did it again. Yeah. He, he bracketed the story in the same idea, just seen from a different perspective. That, That's you know, awesome. Yeah, you know, One is the game hinting at the truth, and one is the letter who's going to directly tell the truth, and yeah. right in between is the meat of the story. And I love how he keeps bringing little things like that out. It, it, it's sad to me in a way. I will keep wanting to say, Matt, why are you not curious enough to break the seal and read the letter? Of course, it would have ruined yeah. everything because the right. timing would not it's have so been good right. Thing he wasn't. Yeah. Yes. But it just, I mean, it hurts so bad that he's carrying the letter to deliver to Tom and Tom has to keep it secret until the right time. And it's just. Five books. He doesn't ask oh, him until Knife of Dreams. Right. And <laughs> Sorry. He, no, it's fine. It's so he, frustrating. It is. He gets close to asking in Saladar, not long yeah. after Tom has read the letter, and because Tom keeps holding it, just like mm-hmm. you know, he's just holding his hand unobtrusively, and waiting for Matt to say something. And Matt says something, but he doesn't outright ask about it. And so mm-hmm. Tom knows it's still not time. But you can see him; he's pressing Matt in a way to ask me about this letter. And yep. of course, you know, my first time through, I had no clue, and I didn't put any of that together. But when you know, then you start seeing those little clues, and it's just so painful. And you you want him to to be that hero a little sooner, so that she can be rescued with you know and have a little more power and a little more influence in what's going on. But but that yeah. wouldn't be the story that we have. So no. Nope. Darth Rand would be a really different, uh, going down a different path if Moraine were still around, I guess. Yes. Or pop back yes. in the story too soon. Right. But I didn't notice just quite how much of that was packed here into this chapter, uh, into Matt's point of view in this chapter. And it's partially because on a first re on a first read through and even a more casual reread, you're not going to notice what's happening in Matt's point of view very much here. <clears throat> Nothing happens much plot wise. Rand comes in and tells Matt what to do. You see snakes and foxes, cute moment with him and Oliver, blah, blah, blah. So what stands out hugely in this chapter is Egwene meeting her toe. Massive, huge moment for her character. Yes. Very memorable. Very important. Very momentous. It's just one of those that I love. And it sets the stage really well for her amazing arc in Knife of Dreams as well. So all this is just buried in there. It's really genius how he did that. Not only did he bookend these clues about the Sindhal and the, the realm of the Finn in 
Matt's point of view, but he also bookended it by something that was way more dynamic so that you're not even going to see, hey, I just telegraphed like 30% of the right. plot of Tower of Midnight right here in these four pages. <laughs> exactly. exactly. You know, I call it bracketing. You know, the beginning of the chapter, end of the chapter, of course, is Egg Wayne, her, you know, very emotional and intense point of view and what she's going through with, with the mm-hmm. wise ones that will set the stage for her to continue to have a relationship with them. So they don't just yeah. turn their backs on her completely. And then, you know, within Matt's point of view, then you have the little brackets and it's really kind of like the little Russian nesting dolls, those little mm-hmm. wooden dolls. You have a small one inside of a larger one, inside of a larger one, and they go together just like the plastic eggs, you know, just snap together. And, and this almost the way that Jordan packages a, a chapter it's you know in the very center of the chapter you can have this one little nugget and then you the other ideas are, are just kind of bracketed around that above and, and behind it so it's it's neat how he does that just the structure of a chapter is is intentional he, mm-hmm. he doesn't just throw an idea out there he he's going to work it in there in a couple of different ways and uh and, and all of them significant so i've just noticed that pattern different times uh throughout many different chapters he he intentionally set up a chapter to have a certain flow to it mm-hmm. um, so you feel like there's, there's i don't know because you feel like there's more continuity to the story or if that's just something he liked to do or if that's just the way the story told itself but i really enjoy that about it just when you break it down and you see that it's it's intriguing to me yeah i struggled to find any uh, thematic <clears throat> parallels between Matt and Egwene in this chapter and why these two stories specifically were the ones put together. I do see that purpose of hiding the clues to Moraine's rescue, but I don't know beyond that. I think it would take a lot more percolating on Egwene's arc specifically. So if we ever go back through and do an Egwene season, then, yeah. you know, reading this chapter after having broken down the Matt part so much and then maybe breaking down the Egwene part I could maybe see some more but right now I'm just I think it might have just been a way a clever way of hiding things but he's so much more clever in how he structures a lot of things that we won't know just yet I think right right I I guess the only thing I could see that would tie those events together would be the fact that both on both of them their story arc is about to take a big tangent but other than mm, yeah. that, I, I agree thematically. There's not really anything to tie those together, but the the blend. I think I think like you said, hers being so dramatic, her his being less so. It it kind of throws you off to the fact that he can hide so many clues in there. And that may have yeah. been his real intention, but yeah, they they I guess are it's swirling towards them actually meeting in Saladar. They're both act, embarking yes. on their journey there because she's yes. not there yet. So yeah, yeah, that makes sense and, too. And hers is more of a, a journey of change and, and the role she's going to play. And his is a journey across the continents to some <laughs> stinking other place to yeah. you know, totally, you know, have his life upended and changed, but definitely be taken away from the band for a while. It's a big change for him. I think, uh, we and other podcasters and other analysts could, could do this for the next century before we really wring out everything that Jordan hid in these stories. That's about all the notes I had on this chapter. Did you have anything else? Uh, no, I believe I'm about talked out for this one. I hope you'll all please join us next week for Season 2, Episode 17, where we cover Chapters 38 and 44 of Lord of Chaos. Subscribe to Wheel of Mind on Podbean, Stitcher, Google Play, Apple, Spotify, or YouTube. And that last one is under the name Lajara Dane, L-A-J-A-R-A-D-A-Y-N-E to get notified when a new episode drops. And leave us feedback by rating and reviewing on your preferred podcast listening platform by contacting us through email at lajaradane at gmail.com on Twitter at lajarasadai or at our website. This is not the ending, but it is an ending to the turning of the wheel of mind. Bye, y'all. But the thing that, that made me think of that was when you, you mentioned Matt being such an old soul. He had all these mm-hmm. memories, you know, if, if just more than lifetimes of memories of other people and there was there's one young man he's like a teenager in the show 17 or 18 years old still in high school and and he almost died of course you know the 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 traveler was sent back consciousness overwrote his that person had gone through a couple of consciousness transfers in the future and he was literally the mind of the oldest living man so he had Mm. he had raised families and grown old been put into a younger body 
raised families, grown old. He, I think he and his wife both were, and they raised another family and grew old. And, and you know, wow, at least, imagine liking somebody that much yes, that you'd live multiple I know, lifetimes yeah. with him. <laughs> and so at least two or three times he'd gone through that before he was sent back to the past, before he volunteered for the traveler program. And he always referred to himself as an old soul. And the actor was so good at that. He, he's, again, he's uh, 17 or 18 years old. He's literally an MMA fighter, um, um, you know, among other things, bef- before going into acting. And he pulls it off so well, you can really believe he's a you know, 250 year old man, you know, because he just like, he, oh. he approaches things with such wisdom and such, uh, a, um, just a, a dignity and all. It, it, you know, the actor really pulled that part off well. Yeah. That sounds like uh, that would be difficult to do in acting, but it made me think of how we're going to have a need for that in the Wheel of Time TV show. We're going to need actors who can portray old souls because many yes. of them are. Yes. We're going to need That's true. R- probably Rand to do some switching back and forth. Like maybe he starts talking and like looking in a different way when the Lose Theron thoughts take over wow. and that kind of thing. And Matt probably has his moments when he looks at the map. I think there's probably going to be maybe some kind of posture demeanor change or something or I think it would be impactful to have that anyway from Barney to be able to communicate that there's so much more of this old wisdom that's that's coming out right now yes yes and I've been really excited looking at these actors and and you know seeing their work of course the um I just saw part one of the interview with um Daniel Mm Heaney and and I just, the more I see him, the more I hear from him, the more I see Lan in him. Yeah. Uh, but he's really fitting that role very well. And, and I've seen on social media people at all ends of the spectrum accepting him, hating him for the role, whatever. And I've seen him play other things that I didn't really know about beforehand. And, but looking him up on IMDb and some of the roles he's played, they're so very different. Yet I think, mm. I think his personality suits him very well to play Lan. Um, I also saw an interview with Zoe Robbins, who played Nynaeve. Yeah, I saw that one too. Yes. And I, it was funny. It was cute to hear her New Zealand yes, accent. Yes, yes. I love the Kiwi accent. It's, she's so yeah. good. But in that, um, you know, I've seen some of her work before. And I've seen pictures and I thought, yeah, I could really picture her as Nynaeve. I can, I can see that. It's starting to, to kind of crystallize for me. But after mm-hmm. seeing that interview, I'm like, her personality is so different from Nynaeve. She's, she looks too sweet. Yes, right? she does. And her face is so mobile, you know, and she'll just, you know, so, oh, yeah. so many expressions flit across her face. Um, so I, I think she can do it, but it's just a credit to what actors and actresses must do to take on this different persona. And, and I mm-hmm. think, I, you know, I think I'm going to be very surprised to see her on screen and how different she is in a in a more candid interview yeah it's gonna be great to see how she looks embodying all yes. that anger yes yes and and this the frustrating you know braid tugging and things if, if they have her do that and i'm sure they will it's such a part of Nynaeve's character <laughs> uh, but yeah I, I'm, I'm really eager i'm really looking forward to this so much and i know it's, it's so frustrating with the the uh, COVID-19 virus, you know, putting a hold on production and they're filming at least. I'm sure some production mm-hmm. work's going on behind the scenes, but uh, you know, making us wait longer for it. But I think the anticipation is going to be worth it. I really do. I think once we get mm-hmm. this show, eh, there'll be some things we're disappointed in. There, there are some things that'll have to change, but I'm, I'm looking forward to it. The more I look into it, the more um, they release about actors and the roles and a few little and scenes locations. here and there. Yes, yes. Have you seen the strange, like, stones with faces on them and stuff? Yes. Oh, yes. Uh, it's hard to, it's interesting to speculate about what all these locations are going to be. That place that looks like a waygate or something, right. Shadow Logoth or something, too. Yeah. Portal Stone, I don't know. Yeah. Um, it's, it's so fun to speculate about those because I know that the, the visuals of what environments are going to look like are one of the things that probably has to be most radically reimagined in a lot of adaptations oh, yes, because yes. you just kind of have to use what structures are available. Right. You know, there's only so much CGI and stuff you can do. Um, so it'll be really cool to see how those locations get embodied and us kind of getting to just sort of adapt to those changes and accept that that's what that place looks like in that version of the world because it's not yeah. going to be our same world as in the books and exactly. that's fine. Yeah. Um, but I am... Uh, excited about just just enough clues that we have and uh, also 
grateful in a way that we have so much more time to catch up in our rereads anyway and get new people reading before the show comes out. Right. So that's one of the ways that we can kind of approach this delay to the the making of the show there yeah. is that maybe we got more time to build up our own anticipation as a fandom. Exactly. And, and I see the, the social media accounts growing and growing. So the, it, yeah, the word same. is spreading. People are getting intrigued. Uh, um, every week I see posts from people who are, you know, in, in, um, the, the great hunt and it's the first time through the series and yeah, they're so excited same. Yeah. on twitter every day there's a new person going anybody out there want to talk about the wheel of time i just finished it or people saying i'm in book four of wheel of time and i want to live tweet it or whatever yeah. it's, it's almost every day yeah. and <laughs> and so many people are gracious about not throwing spoilers in there and mm-hmm. they'll be like oh i can't wait to see agwain and galad and what happens with them you're like I just wait you know <laughs> <laughs> You know, yeah. because we know, and oh, I, you know, will you know, such and such ever do such and such? And and you're like, oh no, it's not. But it's going to be so much better. And and people are not spoiling it for them, but they yeah. they are at least throwing out little tantalizing clues like that. Uh, you know, it is really fun to yeah. watch the new people yeah. talk about their their first yeah. read through. I'm loving it. Oh yeah, you know, oh I love the backstory. Oh wait till you get to Rodion. You know, it's just <laughs> you know, <Yeah. laughs> your your mind is going to be blown if you love backstories. So. Yeah, and seeing that that joy and anticipation from new people, it, it makes you that much more excited for them. It makes you that much more excited for the fandom and how it's growing, and how it, how it'll continue to grow through this. Um, it, yeah, it will change, and I wonder about some of the things they will they will have to change about the story. Like you said, the the waygate things look very strange. I wonder if they don't combine the ways with the portal stones and just have one thing, um, you yeah. know, more like the like maybe Stargate. you pop out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you don't know that. You know, the way we have skimming and then traveling and the limitations mm-hmm. of both. But you know, will they will they do away with some of those? I'm sure there'll be a lot of, of changes like that, um, mm-hmm. as well as combining different characters. Um, you know, I've, I've yeah. seen a lot of people come up with different ideas for that uh will elaine even be in the story at all because we have not had a casting announcement a lot of people have speculated on that one i think she will be i think she's yeah, too big a, people get kind of paranoid right? when we haven't seen one for a while uh-huh. remember tom people were flipping yes, out about tom yes. for months <laughs> he's he's there it's fine now right, yeah right. so that's how i'm feeling about elaine i'm kind of at peace with just waiting exactly <laughs> and i think uh the showrunners ray for them are probably holding back some of this just to create more anticipation to get yeah, more fans sure. screaming for answers because then we're we're remaining engaged so i, I think there's there's some of that going on uh with all mm-hmm. of it but um yeah i'm really excited for the elaine casting right now i just my head cannon pretty much looks like taylor swift which i think is great it's fine yes. but i'm interested to start replacing it with the actor right. uh, who will be revealed to us soon right so. yeah me as well because the ones i have so far i'm you know getting into i'm still struggling a little with loyal because it's hard to mm-hmm. take a human mm-hmm. and ogierize them in your mind enough to to make him fit and so you know when I, sure. when I see the the pictures of the actor and they talked about his casting that during his audition he literally brought them to tears so yeah. i expect it to be good um but he's got to have michael kramer's deep booming voice <laughs> he does, <laughs> does gear voices so well i mean if nothing else bring michael kramer in for uh you know master Heyman or something he's he's we've oh, got yeah. to hear that voice somewhere in here so for right now there's totally. a few of them it's just hard to imagine but most of them uh i'm, I'm getting them inserted into those roles uh, getting rid of the pictures i've had in my mind for you know 20 something years and and picturing the actors and actresses instead and it's it's a process but it's a fun process Mm -hmm. and and i think it'll lend a lot more realism after we've seen the show even after season one if you go back and reread the books you will you will start seeing those scenes and it to me it lends realism it certainly did with the lord of the rings movies you know i was such a fan of those books i had read them numerous times seven or eight times and yet after seeing the movies, reading the books again, there was just there was more depth there. I could picture these scenes so much more yeah. vividly, and the characters so it's much like more vividly. It's like your mind's not having to do as much work to fill in as much of that 
you're not having to generate as much raw data, basically. Right. Right. Like there's already stuff you can use to fill in all these gaps of the scenery. And I always have problem problems visualizing scenery more so than people and, and particular actions. Yes. Uh, so I have a harder time picturing some scenes like big enough. Right. Uh, right. I don't know why there's, there's kind of this like upper limit of how big I can make a room in my mind. Right. And then I have to keep trying, maybe I can double it from there or whatever. <laughs> if they describe something that's too big for that room. Right. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's hard to get that sense of perspective and, um, uh, just you know the the background because like I said you're you're having to imagine so many details, uh, and let's be honest, Jordan gives us a lot of details, you know, a lot of a lot of the mm-hmm. details of the room of the people of the dress, but at the same time you, you you tend to focus on one little thing at a time in your mind, and not all of it at once, and so it's just, it's difficult to do so. <laughs> <laughs>